Welcome everyone, and thanks for attending this Maverick Applied Science webinar. This presentation is Maverick's first webinar, but we expect to provide monthly webinars going forward that will primarily focus on engineering, inspection, and supporting of non-metallic piping and equipment. I will answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of this presentation, but feel free to submit your questions at any time during this presentation so that you don't forget them. Our pipe support division manager and the moderator of these webinars, Steve Romano, will be gathering all your questions uh, during the webinar so that we can get to as many of them as possible at the end. All right, and now on with the show. First, I want to give you a brief explanation of this GoToWebinar program that we're using for these presentations. The GoToWebinar software allows you to ask your questions anytime by typing them into the questions panel anytime during this presentation. To activate the questions panel, click on the arrow on the left-hand side of the questions tab. This will open up the area below the tab and you can type your question in the panel then. When you've typed your question and you're ready, press the send privately button. This will allow us to gather all your questions and then combine similar questions at the end so we can get to as many of them as possible. And now a quick introduction of today's speaker, me, Tom Haber. Between project coordination, field service projects, and various shop and job site inspections, I've been involved in the fiberglass reinforced plastic industry for almost 30 years. My experiences cover most aspects of non-metallic shop manufacturing, field manufacturing, and QA inspections. I've supervised numerous field installations of large FRP projects, including power plant chimney stack liners, flue gas desulfurization ductwork, chemical process piping, and storage tanks and pressure vessels. During this time, I've had the opportunity to the opportunity to witness several hundred positive and negative pressure tests and acoustic emission tests, along with performing many, many hours of ultrasonic testing on equipment. I'm the current chairman of the American Welding Society's G1 Committee for Thermoplastics, a member of the AWS Subcommittee on Plastic Welding Qualifications, and the G1A Subcommittee on Hot Gas Welding and Extrusion Welding. I'm also the current chair of the subgroup for fabrication and examination for the ASME non-metallic pressure piping systems NM2 piping standard, which is the new piping standard that ASME just issued for non-metallic piping. And I'm a member of the ASME RTP1 standard subcommittee for material and quality assurance. And finally, I'm an ASNT certified inspector in the visual technologies method. I know all these credentials must seem very impressive to you all, but mostly it means that I'm hard to get rid of and extremely persistent, which by the way are good qualities to have if you wanna be an inspector. This presentation is intended to give you a basic understanding of what to expect when you need to make repairs or modifications to your existing FRP equipment. Every repair or modification has unique challenges that can't possibly be predicted, but there are basic things which you always need to be addressed. Be prepared to include your facility's safety department, your environmental group, and your plant operations personnel when developing your repair plans. Making any modifications to your FRP equipment is going to require several unique chemicals to be brought onto your plant site. These specialty chemicals normally include the resin, the catalyst, and any cleaning solvents at a minimum. Getting these chemicals onto your plant site will typically require approval from your facility's safety and environmental departments. Any FRP equipment being modified needs to be clean and dry prior to the repairs being performed. Water and other contaminants hinder the bonding and curing ability of the laminates you're going to apply. Also remember that safe access will need to be provided for the repair contractor to make effective repairs. And this is probably going to require some level of involvement from your plant operations people. 
The important things I hope you take away from this presentation are the initial risk assessment of the modifications that you're planning, what typical damages are feasible for repair, some background information you may need regarding codes and bonder certifications, the importance of a well thought out repair procedure, some common repair pitfalls you should hope to never see, how to perform a basic QA inspection of the applied laminates, some typical test requirements for the repaired equipment, the importance of documenting and any repairs or modifications that you make, and finally, what you should expect regarding the remaining service life of your repaired equipment. Prior to developing the repair procedure, you should first determine the criticality of the proposed modification. What are the dangers of making the planned modification to your equipment? FRP equipment being repaired will need to be out of service for an extended period to allow for the repair laminates to properly cure. Can your plant accept the equipment being out of service for at least 24 hours? Can you fully drain the vessel or pipeline you want to modify? What are the risks to the repair contractor's personnel? What level of PPE will you require the repair contractor to wear to safely make the plan modifications? Will the modification you're planning require changes to your process safety management plans? A couple of guides for this risk assessment planning can be found in the ASME B31G Manual for Determining the Remaining Strength of Corroded Pipelines or in the API 579 ASME FF uh, Fitness for Service 1 Repair Guide. There are very few standard resources available for planning your FRP modifications, unfortunately. You may consider using the ASME PCC2 standard for repairing pressure equipment and piping, or trying to pull some of the information out from the ASME RTP1 standard in developing your modification scope and procedures. The ASME RTP1 repair procedures are only intended for use with new vessels which haven't been placed in service yet. However, there are many good requirements within this standards appendix M7, which might be apl applicable to your planned equipment modifications. If neither of these standards provide you with the guidance needed in developing your repair procedure, you should strongly consider hiring a third party subject matter expert to assist you with writing those repair procedures. Once the risks involved with making the repair or modification are understood, the next step is to clearly define the defect being repaired or the intended modification. Are you just adding a flange to a vessel? Something like that. Defects primarily fall into one of two broad damage categories, either corrosion barrier lamin laminate damage or structural laminate damages. Equipment modifications commonly require both structural laminates and corrosion barrier laminates to be applied to provide the necessary strength and corrosion resistance to the modified equipment. Corrosion barrier damages may be from the contained chemicals, from erosion, or from mechanical damages. Structural damages might occur from process or system issues like a water hammer event or from overpressurization or overheating of the equipment during operation. Occasionally, structural damages occur from an external source like a forklift or a crane coming into contact with the equipment, or even water blasting the equipment, or from another equipment's failure like a pipe leaking in close proximity to the equipment. One of the most common sources of damage to non-metallic equipment, though, is from improperly supporting or improperly torquing non-metallic flanges, especially when those flanges are connected to raised-faced equipment. We'll talk about this more in a later slide. If the FRP equipment you're repairing or modifying has been certified to have been built to a fabrication code, like Section 10 of the ASME Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code, then there are a very limited number of repair fabricators who maintain the ASME code stamp for repairing these vessels built to, this, to those requirements. For a code stamp vessel 
you should always first contact the vessel's original manufacturer if possible for assistance. You should confirm what qualifications your repair contractor's personnel hold. Laminators and secondary bonders can be qualified to the ASME RTP1 standard through proof testing or secondary bonders can be qualified to the ASME NPPS NM2 piping standard or the ASME B31.3 pressure piping standard. Field repairs of non-metallic equipment are significantly more difficult than shop production work. So whenever possible, you should require that only qualified laminators and secondary bonders are performing your modifications or repair work. It is my recommendation that their geographical, geographical location not be your primary criteria when you choose the repair contractor. Repairs made by experienced, qualified technicians will provide significantly more confidence that the expected service life of your repaired equipment has been safely extended. Any initial cost difference between using an unqualified but local repair contractor and using a qualified non-local repair contractor is usually offset by the increased longevity of a properly made repair. To put this into perspective a little bit, would you allow an unqualified local repair contractor to modify a piece of your metal alloy equipment for you just because their shop was located within a close proximity to your facility? I doubt it. So why would you let proximity be your primary selection criteria when modifying FRP equipment? I promise you, modifying FRP equipment is just as difficult and has just as many critical steps required for success as a metal alloy equipment modification. Ask for certified repair technicians, even if it takes them a few more hours to travel to your job site. FRP repairs and modifications require clearly defined procedures so that your installing contractor understands what your expectations are. You should utilize your company's non-metallic expert for non-metallic subject matter expert when you're preparing a repair method or modification request. If your company doesn't have a non-metallic equipment SME, you should consider using a third-party SME for your non-metallic equipment repair procedures. Clearly defined procedures will help you and the installing contractor, and they're the best way to ensure that any modifications that you make are clearly understood. When you're producing your repair procedure, you can often look to the original equipment fabricator's production drawings to find key manufacturing information, such as the originally used resin and reinforcement types. If you don't have the original fabrication drawings, you might be able to find this information on the equipment's nameplate, assuming you can still read it. Any repair or modification made to the internal or external corrosion barrier laminates of your FRP equipment will require you to make a surfacing veil selection along with choosing the proper resin. Surfacing veils are reinforcement fabrics which are capable of holding roughly 90% of their weight in resin to obtain the highest level of corrosion resistance that the resin can provide. Keep in mind too, that different surfacing veil types may have been used for the internal and external corrosion barrier laminates. Some common corrosion barrier damages we've seen repaired include stress cracking, surface cracking, and delaminations of the internal laminates. Be aware that stress cracking may be evidence of a larger issue though. Stress cracking damage may mean that the equipment's structural laminates aren't performing as designed to stiffen the equipment and reduce any flex that's happening within the equipment laminates. For example, a laminate delamination in the lower knuckle region of a flat bottom vessel, like the one seen in the bottom center picture of this slide, may indicate that the vessel's transition knuckle doesn't have the proper structural reinforcement to resist the influence of simply storing the chemical or from cycling during normal operations of filling and emptying the vessel. 
Another common internal issue we've seen is corrosion barrier blisters. Blisters may not need to be repaired if they aren't expanding in size or in quantity, but large irregularly shaped delaminations like the ones portrayed in the lower left picture of this slide will normally require a repair of some sort. Corrosion barrier damage like cracking with obvious gaps and areas of completely peeled away corrosion barrier laminates always require, require a proper repair. Any corrosive damage from the service fluids being stored or processed should be monitored at every outage occasion. Taking hardness readings on the equipment's internal laminates at regular intervals will allow you to track any corrosion damage. It is not a good idea to randomly scrape away any existing softened corrosion barrier laminates. Even when their strength has been compromised, these laminates that are damaged do provide some corrosion resistance, and they shouldn't be removed except when necessary or when you're re ready to replace them in their entirety. Pay particular attention to the inside of inlet nozzle flanges, like the one shown in the top right picture on this slide. The vessel's overall contents can dilute the full strength of chemicals that are being introduced through the nozzles. So the vessel's primary corrosion barrier laminates often see much different corrosive service than the chemical inlet nozzles, which will see the full strength chemical being injected through them. Erosion damages to the internal laminate surfaces and their attachment overlays can also be tracked through your regular maintenance inspections. Making regular internal inspections of your FRP equipment is key to being able to make any necessary repairs on your timeline, and not when a catastrophic failure of the equipment occurs. Damage from an internal or external impact may also have caused internal laminate damage, as seen in the top two pictures of this slide. Using a flashlight, can often help you determine the depth of these cracks to see if they've traveled deeper into the structural laminates or if they'll only require a relatively simple corrosion barrier repair. Occasionally outside influences like inserting dip tubes or from air spargers and agitators can cause damage to the internal corrosion barrier of your equipment also. Repairing wear issues such as these should be reviewed to determine if additional laminates or additional laminate additives are needed. These might include localized wear pads or abrasion resistance being added into the replacement corrosion barrier laminates. Internal repairs made to FRP vessels are normally much more difficult than external repairs. Internal vessel access typically requires the repair technicians to work to wear additional PPE, like chemical suits, rubber boots, and harnesses. These repairs will also require the use of air monitoring devices inside the vessel and other confined space requirements, such as respirators or supplied breathing air, possibly. These necessary PPE requirements will hinder the, rest, the repair technicians' movements, though, and their ability to work for long durations. Keep in mind also that any repairs that are more than four feet above the floor level, at most of your plants anyway, will require some method of safe access to reach the repair area. Always be careful using scaffolding inside of non-metallic equipment though, because the scaffolding can cause additional damages to the floor's corrosion barrier laminates if the scaffolding isn't properly cushioned. When the FRP equipment's external corrosion barrier is noted to have damage from fluid leaks near or above the vessel, as seen in the picture on the left, or from regularly overflowing the vessel's contents, these damages will often include some structural damage to the vessel, which must be treated separately from the damage to the corrosion barrier. UV degradation, as seen in the photo on the right, is a common problem with FRP equipment which is operated outdoors. These damages are largely cosmetic and do not typically require any repair to be made to the external laminates. When planning your repair procedures, 
always consider the access requirements for the repair contractor to work safely. Safe access can be provided in many different ways, and this is usually an easy issue to overcome with proper initial planning. Remember that the repair access provided may need to include a local work area for the repair contractor to wet out laminates. This will help the contractor avoid moving wet laminates up or down significant distances from a wet out table to get them to the repair location. Structural repair laminates are often larger and thicker than internal repair laminates and will require more working time to apply them properly. Repairing the structural laminates of, non, of non-metallic equipment should always include an experienced engineer's review of the damage, since any structural repairs will affect the equipment's ability to continue to operate safely and as designed. If the service fluids have penetrated through the equipment's corrosion barrier and have found a leak all the way to the outside, there will be structural damage to your equipment. Through wall leaks are rare in non-metallic equipment, but if you do notice them, contact your non-metallic SME for their assistance in developing a repair plan. Keep in mind that you cannot expect to permanently stop a through wall leak with only a repair patch applied to the exterior laminates of your equipment. Through wall leaks are significant issues and require a comprehensive repair plan to ensure their safe and reliable future of the uh, use of the equipment. There are some internal items which have structural loading requirements also, and may also require structural integrity repairs to be made. Packing supports, baffles, and other internal items like stilling wells and overflow weirs have unusual loading requirements which may influence their repair procedures. These items may require multiple repair processes and may include both structural laminates and corrosion barrier repair laminates. Typically, the structural laminates would be applied first, and then those structural laminates are capped by a corrosion barrier laminate that protects the structural laminate from any corrosion damage. Often there are underlying engineering root causes for structural issues, which will also need to be addressed. Any structural issue that you note for repair should be reviewed by an experienced engineer to determine the root cause if possible. Simply patching structural damages without determining the root cause behind the issue can lead to a future catastrophic failure of the equipment. The proper supporting of valves, attached equipment, or platforms and other connecting piping is critical to maintaining the structural integrity of your FRP equipment. Because of the manufacturing methods used to produce most fiberglass flanges, it is very difficult to determine the true depth of any fractures noted in the hub area of a fiberglass flange. Bolting flat faced flan FRP flanges to a raised, raised face valve, that's a lot of Fs, to a raised face valve or other equipment flanges without the proper use of a spacer or filling ring will cause hub cracking issues. Improper flange torquing procedures or excessive bolt torque values being used are another significant contributor to the flange hub cracking issues. You should always make sure that your maintenance people have a torque wrench and use a torque wrench and a proper torque procedure with FRP flanges. I have heard many, many times when I ask a maintenance person on a job site, what torque value did you use? Well, we torque it to the first snap. Well, the first snap is a break, and that's not a good thing for an FRP flange. Damages to mating flanges are among the most common issues seen with non-metallic equipment. There is no way to effectively repair an FRP flange, which exhibits cracking in the hub area. The safest way to avoid a future catastrophic failure because of a damaged FRP flange is to replace it. And then ensure you aren't mounting FRP flanges to raise face equipment, along with using the correct bolt torque procedures. As seen in the bottom two pictures of this slide, what appears to be a relatively insignificant crack on the surface of the hub 
which is shown in the lower left-hand photograph, may actually be a fracture that travels deep into the laminate and significantly weakens the flange, as you can see in the lower right-hand picture. Those two pictures are of the same flange, just looking at it in two different ways. But if you haven't had the chance to cut that flange in half and look at the end cut of it to see how deep the damage travels, there's no way to tell from the picture on the left how far it goes. Okay, putty is used to fill large gaps between, I shouldn't say large, putty is just used to fill gaps between assembled parts or to create a smooth transition between parts being attached together. The use of filler putty should be minimized as much as possible since the putty has almost no structural bonding value and may actually hinder an applied overlay laminate's effectiveness due to the bond not being between the actual parts being repaired or attached together. Excessive putty should always be removed by grinding prior to the application of any over FRP overlay laminates. Most FRP repair requirements call for the worksite's ambient temperature to be in a range between 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 95 degrees Fahrenheit during the overlay application. It's also important that you confirm the surface temperature of the part where the laminates are going to be applied that they also meet this requirement because direct sunlight will cause the application area surface temperature to be higher than the ambient air temperature. Additionally, the dew point or local humidity level during any laminate application needs to be verified to be greater than five degrees above the ambient worksite temperature. This will ensure that the repair surfaces aren't contaminated with moisture. Moisture will inhibit the proper cure of the resin within the laminates and lead to a gummy, milky appearance of the laminate. And then when you go to grind them off, it just makes a fuzzy mess and everybody will be unhappy. It's better to pull these laminates off. It's better best to not even apply these laminates if you're anywhere near dangerous uh, ambient worksite conditions. A secondary bond's adhesion strength is influenced by a couple of factors. The chemical bond between the repair laminate resin and the resin in the existing equipment's laminate and the surface profile roughness of the parts being joined. Surface preparation is a key factor in a laminate's bonding adhesion. The proper grinding of all surfaces rep receiving repair laminate should be verified. The area highlighted in red in the top right picture shows an area which has been previously ground prior to the installation of the flange. But if you notice the dark areas that are remaining, those are from the use of a rubber mallet to it saw the flange. This is an indication that a complete grinding of the surfaces to remove all the contaminants hasn't been performed. Within four to six hours prior to the application of any overlay laminate, any surface re receiving laminates should have been properly ground to ensure that those areas are free of any contaminants. There are special bonding resins with unique characteristics which allow them to adhere to many previously contaminated surfaces or to metal or concrete surfaces. These resins act as an intermediary layer between the equipment being repaired and the newly applied laminates. Bonding resins are typically applied to the equipment surface that's going to receive the overlay laminate and then allowed to partially cure before the application of any additional laminates. If the equipment being repaired or modified has been in service, there is a much higher likelihood that you're going to experience laminate bonding issues. Peel bond testing can help you determine if you're gonna have bonding issues before you begin your primary repairs. Initially, peel bond testing should be performed with only the planned repair resin and without a bonding resin. The use of a bonding resin should only really be considered after you've determined that a successful bond can't be achieved with just the proposed repair resin. Peel bond testing involves applying a laminate patch partially onto the substrate being repaired 
and partially over a release film like mylar the unbonded area that was applied over the release agent then provides an area to start the peeling of the repair of the uh, peel test laminate if you include at least one layer of woven roving um, reinforcement within your peel test patch it can increase the likelihood that the patch will actually peel and not just fracture off at the bond line. The movie you see in this slide shows us a, a successful peel test. The technician isn't jerking the patch back and forth and trying to break it off at a bond line, but he's gradually pulling on the test patch to remove it. If the peel test patch shows more than 75% of its surface to have torn white fibers, the peel test is usually considered to have passed. A failing peel test is usually clearly not bonded and will just pop off without much resistance. Many internal corrosion barrier laminates can be applied in a single package, which would include all the necessary reinforcement layers. Most internal corrosion barrier laminates are going to have a high resin content though. So these laminates should be limited in thickness to about a quarter inch of the total laminate being applied at one time before allowing this laminate to exotherm and cool prior to applying any additional laminates. Additional laminate packages being applied need to have some overlap between the packages, the patches, sorry. Usually one inch to two inches of overlap is sufficient. Due to laminate overlap requirements, the areas where the applied laminate patches overlap may see an increase in exotherm temperatures due to the additional laminate thickness in those areas. Feathering or staggering the individual laminate reinforcement layers when wetting out a package will minimize this increase in thickness in the overlap areas. When performing the QA inspection of any applied laminates, especially internal laminates, always pay particular attention to these overlapped areas. Your repair laminate thicknesses and widths should be clearly defined in your repair procedure prior to the repair contractor arriving at your site to make the repairs. You should hire an FRP repair contractor for their laminate application skills and their safety record and have your facility's non-metallic equipment SME set your laminate size requirements and your quality expectations. The thickness and width requirements for structural repair re reinforcement laminates are much different than corrosion barrier laminates because structural laminates are required to counteract any imposed loading that's placed on the equipment. Structural repairs will also typically utilize different laminate reinforcement layers like woven roving or other directional roving reinforcements that will provide the additional strength that's necessary. Often the quality requirements for structural laminates is slightly less also, since these laminates are intended for primarily contributing strength to the equipment and not for their corrosion or fluid containment capabilities. If you didn't provide the installing contractor with your laminate quality expectations prior to them beginning the work, you don't have any way to enforce your quality expectations. All applied laminates should be free of large entrapped air bubbles, even in the difficult transition areas like T's and Y's. You should confirm the cure of the resin within the applied laminates through bark all hardness testing, which you can compare to the resin manufacturer's recommended hardness expectation. This is typically shown in their product data sheets, which are available online. The use of some reinforcement layers, such as synthetic veils or certain resin additives like graphite, may lower the laminate hardness readings you get. Consult the resin manufacturer for their recommended minimum laminate hardness if you have any concerns. Acetone sensitivity will provide you confidence that the laminate surface has properly cured. This test is performed by adding a few drops of clean acetone, clean acetone 
to a finished laminate surface and then rubbing the acetone until it evaporates. If the laminate surface becomes sticky or tacky, then the laminate may not be well cured. Depending on the severity of your equipment service, the extent of the modifications or repairs that were required to be made, and the timing of your facility's next inspection cycle, you should consider proof testing the applied laminates. Make sure that all the applied laminates are fully cured prior to any pressure testing being performed. And the use of a trained non-metallic acoustic emission inspection company can also provide you with additional confidence in the structural ability of your repaired equipment. If you weren't involved in specifying your repair requirements, and you left the repair laminate size requirements up to the installing contractor, you should require the contractor to provide you with detailed drawings that are marked up to show all the repaired areas and what repair laminates they applied. Clear documentation of any repairs is key to being able to monitor if that repair has solved your problem or if you're going to have more future significant repairs that are going to be necessary. The life of any repair is heavily influenced by the installing contractor's skills and your subject matter expert's ability to provide complete, detailed requirements for the installing contractor to follow. An inspection of the applied repairs should be made at the next available plan outage to confirm that the repairs are performing as you expected. We have seen large process vessels, like the one shown in this picture, in this slide, which were completely relined successfully several times. In this case, the original vessel's corrosion barrier lasted 15 years of service before it was required to be replaced. The secondarily applied re replacement corrosion barrier then lasted 10 years before requiring it to be replaced. And now the customer is hoping to get at least seven years from the third replacement corrosion barrier. We've also seen manways that were added onto a demineralized water storage tank that had laminates which still look brand new after 15 years in service. No field applied laminate should be assumed to be as sound as the originally applied shop laminate though. That's just the reality of field repairs. Now we've come to the questions and answers portion of the webinar. Steve, how about starting me off with an easy question from the audience, please? An easy question came in at 11 o'clock, and the question <laughs> was, did you bring donuts? Yes, there are donuts in my office, and you're all welcome to one. <laughs> uh, yes, we have quite a few questions here. Um, we'll, we'll start from the beginning. Um, okay. First question came in about blistering. The question was, why, why are irregular shaped blisters required to be repaired, but regular shaped blisters do not? Irregular shaped blisters typically show that there's been some additional mechanical influence besides just the osmosis of the process fluids being absorbed through the laminate. In a typical round blister, there's some osmosis, some transfer of the liquids that are going on through the laminate. And when those expand and contract, when the process gets hot and gets cold, those blisters will start to form. And a naturally occurring blister will form in a round circular pattern. If you have irregular shaped blisters, it's probably gonna indicate that there was some bonding problem between the corrosion barrier and the structural laminates, or there's some additional flex going on in that area, which is causing the blister to not be round. Okay, thanks. Second question is related to fiber bloom. Um, you stated that it is cosmetic and it does not in, does not involve loss of resin. Does it have any impact on structural capacity? And what would be the surface preparation to make a repair? Yeah, that's a difficult question because if if you've waited long enough that there's actual reinforcement fabric that has completely come to the surface, it's difficult to prepare that reinforcement fabric through grinding because it's just gonna fuzz when you try to grind it. Um, you wanna try to catch it early enough 
so that you can do some light grinding, light sanding before you apply a resin-based uh, coating with UV protectants in it. And if not, then you're going to have to find a way to uh, to paint it with a a non-UV, I mean a non-resin-based paint, and just hope that the application still works. Um, a lot of times, the problem that you'll see with painting over laminates that are like that is that those laminates, um, th that paint is not going to bond at all to the reinforcement fabric that's been exposed to the environment for a long time. Next question is uh, um, related to um, raised face flanges. What type of spacers would you recommend or do you use? Uh, there are polymer, there are thermoplastic uh, rings that can be purchased that basically look like the backing rings on a Vanstone uh, flange. The problem is, is that each fiberglass flange is uh, not always a consistent thickness based on their pressure ratings. So you almost have to buy set thickness um, of, reinfor of uh, filler spacer rings that will still allow some movement of the flange to allow proper torquing of the gasket and closure of the flange to flange connection without forming another uh, issue where the flanges can't come together enough and create, and create uh, torque on the gasket. So thermoplastic rings, filler rings are common and uh, those are the ones we would typically recommend based on your service that thermoplastic may change. And then based on the gap, the thickness of the total gap, you would have to verify that before um, you buy the, flan the uh, filler ring. Next question is related to surface prep. And you may have answered this question. This question came in before you finished that section. It sure. was, is there a standard or third party method to objectively determine the sufficiency of preparation as part of a QA procedure? The only real way is to do, do it through peel bond testing and then ensure that the laminates that are applied follow the requirements that were in place for that peel bond test. There's not a good surface, um, like on a metal, you can check the surface profile um, using different methods, but there's not a good method to check surface profile on fiberglass. You just have to make sure that it's well grounded, uh, well sanded, well ground, and that the applied laminates stay on the sanded surfaces. Next question is kind of a question that's relating to surface prep. Um, it says four hours before to avoid contamination. That's the entire question. Not really sure what he's asking, but he's maybe asking for clarification. On, sure. On yeah, four hours before, you know, that's not a recommendation that we would normally give but you want them within at least four hours to be sanded. You don't want the sanding to have occurred the shift before or the night before. Typically, we would recommend sanding right before the application of a laminate patch, but a lot of times that's not feasible because of how things are installed. You may have a group that's doing the sanding earlier and then it's a break and then they take a break. Um, so we use four, hopefully less than four hours as a minimum for having sanded the area properly. But if you're gonna sand it preliminarily, you know, four to six hours ahead, we recommend covering the area so that there's no additional contaminants that get onto the surfaces. But we would recommend immediate sanding is the preferred method for any laminate application. Good, next question is a two-part question on, um, on um, international work, um, are there any FRP repair standards for international work and are there any international bonder certification standards? There are uh, other international cert uh, certifications, I think through British standards, through uh, other standards like that. Um, we do not typically work with a lot of those here in the US and so we, and we know we are a part of the standards that are used here in the US. We sit on those committees here at Maverick, so we know their requirements meet the typical requirements that we would expect for solid, good work. So we typically would expect people to work to the ASME requirements um, that we would recommend or the API requirements. Um, those standards can be achieved anywhere in the world. And yes, there are other EIN standards and things like that but uh, we typically stick to the ASME standards that we know well, because again, we sit on those committees. We know those requirements work. 
Next question is, are there temperature limits for bonding agents if these bonding agents are needed? Yes, there are. So if you're going to need a, a bonding agent, you are going to typically want to talk to that company that produces that resin. Um, Dow produces one uh, through Enios. I believe there's an ATLAC also that's commonly used. So if you're going to have any kind of process conditions that are involved that, that involve high temperatures or specific high chemical um, concentrations, you're going to want to have that repair laminate kind of blessed either by a subject matter expert on your company or a third party or through the resin company's confirmation that that bonding resin will actually work at those higher temperatures. Okay, this is regarding repair work. Um, how thick would a minimum patch over an application be? What's, I'm guessing he's asking what's the minimum patch thickness? Yeah, that depends on a lot of factors. To give you an idea, <clears throat> a corrosion barrier laminate may only be 100 mil. Um, if all you're doing is replacing, is repairing a crack that was uh, in a storage, a water storage tank, you may only need 100 mil of repair laminates, uh, just maybe three layers to give you what you need in that application. But if you're repairing a structural crack on the outside of a vessel or a piece of pipe, those laminates are going to be significantly thicker. Uh, and you're going to have, that's where your subject matter experts come into play. They have to be able to judge the situation, judge the application site, and determine if it's a simple, thin corrosion barrier laminate application or if there's underlying issues that need to be repaired along with those thin laminates that can be applied. Next question is about the webinar itself, asking if it will be available. Sure. We are recording this webinar and this will be available later. I don't Correct. know if it will be available today, but it will be available probably within 24 hours um, for your reference. Um, next one is if a laminate fails an acetone sensitivity test, what are ways to solve this issue? Uh, one of the easiest ways is to grind it. <laughs> grind the laminate back and apply additional laminates, which will cure correctly. Um, but to do that, you're going to have to do some level of depth testing to find out if there's an issue just on the surface from air inhibition of the uh, resin not curing on the surface. Or as you do the grinding, if you find again, fluffy laminates, um, soft laminates go deeper, then you may well have to take that entire repair patch off that was applied and begin the process entirely over again. So it depends on the depth, the surface, the acetone sensitivity is typically a surface resin test to ensure that the air hasn't inhibited the cure of the resin on the surface of the laminate. But until you do a little bit of additional sanding, you won't know that it's just a surface problem. If it is just a surface problem, you may be able to apply a minimum amount of laminates instead of the full repair patch laminate. You may be able to apply just one mat in a veil and the reinforcing uh, synthetic veil or, or surfacing veil. Or you may have to increase the uh, laminate thickness to overcome whatever laminates didn't cure properly. Next question is, is it is it possible to have a Teflon corrosion barrier in an FRP storage tank? And do you it recommend is. acoustic emission testing for FRP tanks to determine if there are any cracking? Uh, Two-part question. Yes, it is possible question. to have a dual laminate tank. Uh, dual laminates are used commonly throughout the world, and there are additional requirements for dual laminate tanks. I didn't speak as much in this uh, webinar about dual laminate tanks. But instead of the fiberglass corrosion barrier, uh, you would just have a thermoplastic corrosion barrier, which is typically applied, uh, the, the structural laminates are applied over the thermoplastic corrosion barrier. Now, those thermoplastic corrosion barriers have different repair procedures and different bonding procedures. So that would be something, if you have a dual laminate tank that needs to be repaired, you need to have a subject matter expert that understands dual laminate equipment because otherwise you may well make a what you think is a simple repair that will cause you additional problems down the line. And what was the second half, Steve, uh, about AE testing? Yes. Yes, AE testing is an excellent way to monitor the structural integrity of your vessel. 
Um, AE testing will find any damage that's that's occurring, but AE testing, even though it's called non-destructive, you have to pressurize the equipment, whether it's a vessel or a piece of pipe. It has to be pressurized above or very close to uh, the higher limit of where it's been run because you have to overcome the natural tendency of the fiberglass to relax at a certain pressure. So you have to be able to get the pressure up to a point where you can start to induce any noise if there's going to be any. So yes, acoustic emission uh, testing is a very good way to ensure the structural reliability of your vessel. You just have to understand how the test works and uh, make sure you have the ability to do that. Okay, uh, next question. Would you say that the damage from structural attachments, not piping, is most often caused by poor design, poor fabrication practices, or just overloading? I would say it's usually poor installation practices. And I always hate to put this on the uh, installing contractor or on the plant site, but again, if your maintenance people or your installation people who are attaching flanges together that are non-metallic, don't have a torque wrench and don't have a proper torque procedure, they're going to break something. Again, how often have I heard we torque it to the first crack? Well, the first crack is the first laminate crack, and a laminate crack in a fiberglass flange is a bad thing. Steel flanges will bend and, and accept some bending. Fiberglass flanges are going to bend also, but they're going to crack when they bend. So the most common thing I see uh, with a fiberglass flange problem is a torquing or bolting to a raised face flange issue. If you see cracks in flanges that are well bolted and are correctly attached to each other, then you have to start looking at engineering issues to see if there was some kind of additional forces that are being applied to those flanges that wasn't expected. Okay, um, this uh, also related to flanges. Is there a torque table or guideline for FRP to metallic piping connections? Yeah, this is types and sizes, types and sizes of bolts and washers. Sure. This is another unfortunate uh, thing about fiberglass right now is that each fiberglass manufacturer produces flanges that are manufactured in different ways. Some are going to be contact molded, which is hand layup process. Some are machine made. Some are glued on. Some are welded on. And each manufacturer has to be able to provide their flange torque requirements. Um, torque requirements is a, is a deep, deep subject that engineers much more brilliant than I um, have struggled with because you, you have an issue with the bolt tension, you have an issue with bolt relaxation, you have to use the proper gaskets, which are soft enough to accept the torque and hold the torque and yet hard enough to be able to minimize corrosion and things like that. So the problem with fiberglass flange torques is, is that there's a number of factors that go into them. And again, an intelligent subject matter expert needs to be conduct needs to be talked to about your torque procedures. You can go to the fiberglass manufacturer and they will give you their typically recommended torque values. And I would tell you that you're probably going to find them to be much lower than you would expect for a metal flange. You know, it's not uncommon to see 10, 15, 25 foot pounds of torque being required on a fiberglass flange rather than 50 or 100 foot pounds of torque that you might see on some metal flanges. Okay, next question. Does resin coating need to match existing coating? Um, I guess he's referring to different types of resins available. And sure. what if I need and what if I need NSF 61? Yes, yes. Resin resins do need to be compatible with each other. Uh, for instance, epoxy resins won't stick to some things. Um, isothalic resins that are used for some uh, paint coats won't stick to epoxies, things like that. They'll look great when you first put them on. In a week, they'll all be peeled off and you'll be complaining about your installation contractor. So yes, there is requirements that the uh, resins be able to bond to each other because on a UV coating like that, that, there's not typically a lot of sanding or surface prep that's done to give it a mechanical bond. So yes, it's very important for that. And, um, yeah, and addressing yeah. the NSF61, if there's internal 
uh, repair work, then yes, you have to have a resin that will actually meet NSF 61. That's if right. That's, that's an issue. And there are additional requirements to meet NFS uh, 61 requirements, NSF 61 requirements, such as post curing the laminates uh, to ensure that all the styrene or as much of the styrene as possible has been driven out. It changes your additives you can add within the resin to cure it. So yes, for anything that's uh, NSF required, you're going to want to make sure that you understand that process and that your repair contractor understands that process too. Um, next question is, can flange filler rings be used to protect bolts from process fluids? Typically, you want your gaskets to uh, protect your bolts and other things and not your thermoplastic spacer rings. The spacer rings are really there just to make sure that the fiberglass flanges don't bend too far um, and not to create any kind of fluid containment. How many more, Steve? We're getting close to our time uh, here. Yep, there's just a couple more. Okay. Um, what is the acetone grain grade used for sensitivity testing? Is there an ASME or ASTM method to reference? Uh, I do not know of an ASME or ASTM test method for acetone sensitivity, and I don't know of different grades of acetone, to be honest with you. That, that's a question I can't answer. But when I said clean, you want to make sure that the fabricator who's or wherever you're getting your acetone from is clean, because fabricators will also use acetone as a solvent to clean their tools and make sure that their work areas are cleaned up. And if you try to use dirty acetone we call it acetone that's already been used to clean tools it's going to have some resin in it and as you try to do a, a acetone sensitivity test with that acetone you'll get stickiness even though you may not have an issue so most important is that you use clean acetone okay there's a few more questions but i think we'll answer these offline um okay. since we're running out of time i'd like to thank everybody for their time and uh Thanks, Tom, thank Tom for doing the presentation. Absolutely. If you, got any, if you got any further comments, Tom? Yep. Yeah, I'd like to take just a quick minute to uh, plug the next Maverick webinar that we have planned. Daryl McCulloch, Maverick's engineering manager, is going to present next on FRP system analysis and pipe support issues to ensure reliability. Um, which will discuss one of the great benefits of FRP pipe, being that it's customizable to provide optimal material properties and strengths. However, this can trip up a pipe stress analyst who is not familiar with FRP mechanics. So Daryl's webinar will present analysis approaches when using FRP piping, as well as discussing the supports necessary to bring this theory into reality. Now, understand that it probably won't be as interesting as my presentation, but please try to keep Daryl's feelings in mind and listen in if you can. The next webinar should take place sometime in early August, and I promise it will inform you of the actual date when it gets firmed up. Well, that's it for me. Thanks for your time. I appreciate you spending the last hour or so with me. Feel free to reach out to me with in the future if you have any non-metallic equipment questions. Deep down, I'm a people person, and I really just enjoying helping others. Take care, everyone. Stay safe, and I'll talk to you again soon.